time start, but I first of all want to open um, today's event by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and as a guest on this land, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to live here and serve as Dean of the Faculty of Law. As a law school, we acknowledge and affirm our responsibility to combat historical and ongoing injustices that indigenous peoples endure in Canada and to contribute to renewing respectful relationships with indigenous communities through our learning, teaching, research, and service. And this brings me to the Goodman Lecture, one of the highlights in our calendar every year. The Goodman Fellowship was established in memory of the late David B. Goodman, QC of Toronto, by members of his family, friends, and professional associates with the intention of bringing to the law school on an annual basis a distinguished member of the practicing bar or bench for teaching, in this case a lecture, and informal discussions with the student body and faculty. And so I want to encourage in particular the students here, I'm delighted to see you all to take advantage of the opportunity at the end of the lecture to ask questions and engage with our wonderful speaker. And so the intention of the founders of this fellowship was that the Goodman Fellow would on the one hand bring to the faculty the benefit of insights and ideas gained from long experience in the practical application of law, and on the other hand, be refreshed by a short return to the academic legal community. I know for sure that the first intention will be realized in spades tonight, and I'm very much hoping that we're able to offer you some refreshment, intellectual and otherwise, in return. But I don't want to go on for much longer. I am delighted now to introduce Professor David Deisenhaus. David is Professor of Law and Philosophy at the University of Toronto, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and a corresponding Fellow of the British Academy. He holds the faculty's Albert Abel Chair of Law, and in 2015 was appointed to the rank of University Professor, which is the University of Toronto's highest and most distinguished academic rank. His work is wide ranging and I won't even begin to list the many influential books, let alone articles he has authored. Suffice it to say that he is, and that is not an exaggeration, the world's leading thinker on legality and notably legality under stress. So David, thank you so much for introducing this year's Goodman Lecturer, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Yuda, for those generous words, and uh, thank you especially for allowing me the honor of uh, introducing Lady Hale to you. I thought I would start where uh, she started just a month after she gave the prorogation judgment, which may be the best-known judgment her court has given in some centuries. This was at an Association of State Girls Schools Annual Conference. and. Uh, Lady Hale opened uh, this meeting of head teachers, I think, by saying, let's hear it for the girly swats. Now, for those of you who follow uh, UK politics, you will know that this is a reference to Boris Johnson's jibe at his political rival Cameron, the, the tabloids after you started the meeting with this remark, claimed that there was a constitutional crisis. And I wondered, after having uh, read your memoir, which is unfortunately not available in hard copy in Canada yet, but in a way, fortunately, on Kindle, so one can search a Kindle in a way one can't a hard copy, that actually you're very fond of the word SWAT. It, uh, it occurs uh, seven times in this work, and twice, a specky SWAT. What is a specky SWAT? It's someone who works very hard and wears uh, spectacles. And indeed, the book is a tale of how hard work can get someone of immense talent to the pinnacle of the legal profession, not by the usual route, that is by being a barrister in London, and in the face of persistent male prejudice, all of which you recount frankly, but with uh, great good humor. Now, Boris Johnson, of course, is quite the opposite of you. He's a Balliol man, 
And as many of you might know, the informal uh, motto of Balliol College is effortless superiority. I've discovered that after several years of Boris Johnson, no one's talking about effortless superiority anymore. I kind of wish you had called the book, uh, let's share it for the SWATs, <laughs> rather than Spider Woman. But uh, given the attention given to the brooch that you were wearing on the occasion of the prorogation matter, I suppose it was inevitable that you would give it uh, that title. I'm not going to talk any more about your relationship with Boris Johnson. Maybe you'll say something about that. Instead, I'm going to talk about your relationship with uh, John Finnis, the retired philosopher of law in the University of Oxford, who I believe is the most influential uh, legal academic of perhaps the last 40 years or so. Why is that? One can look at the US Supreme Court, where he has uh, two, let's we call them uh, disciples. Uh, there are disciples whom I will not name on Canadian courts, on Apex courts. And what's more, there's the Judicial Power Project in the UK, which has the ear of uh, the conservative governments, and I uh, think which is leading the charge when it comes to uh, enemies of judicial independence. The first time I thought about uh, Lady Hale in relation to John Finnis was when I read a paper by John Finnis on a case decided in 2006, Begum and Denby High School, in which you gave one of the judgments upholding the school board's uh, code of dress. And your judgment, I think, uh, came closest to the kind of judgment that a Canadian judge would have given, because you emphasized in uh, your judgment, as I recall, the proportionality of uh, the dress code. Why? This was a, a predominantly Muslim school, but the head was Muslim, the majority of the school board was Muslim, and in devising the code, they had consulted widely including with the local imams. So in that light, you considered that this was uh, a reasonable code and you weren't going to second guess uh, the school board. John Finnis thought otherwise. He claimed that the implicit message of the House of Lords, as it then was, was that uh, Shabina Begum, a young girl, was part of a vanguard seeking to destroy the UK way of life, outbreeding the natives, I kid you not, and he advocated a humane incentivization of non-citizen Muslims to leave the UK. And since then, he's become an advocate of the great replacement uh, theory, which is animating the right in the US today. More directly, it was John Finnis who first publicly suggested the prorogation. And since the uh, Supreme Court's unanimous judgment, an instant classic of common law constitutionalism written over a weekend, he has been leading the charge against judicial independence. Lady Hale, you end your book by saying that our rights and freedoms depend upon those in political power acting within the powers which the law has given them. And then come the last three words, otherwise is tyranny. I share your fear, but I want to point out that in the US and Canada, there's no real attack on judicial independence. Here and in the US, lawyers are seeking to persuade judges that they should adopt the method advocated under the seemingly innocuous title of common good constitutionalism. What is common good constitutionalism? Well, if you want to know, here's a clue. Look to something called the Common Good Project, which is hosted by Oxford University's uh, law website. According to the Common Good Project, what the common good is, is that the ruler promulgates the common good. And the substitute for the ruler king in our orders can be no other than the executive and there too lies tyranny. We look forward to your talk. Well, Dean, Professor Dysonhouse, thank you both very much indeed. The Dean for the invitation and Professor Dysonhouse for that very illuminating introduction, if I may say so. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my sixth at least time in Canada, but my first in Toronto. So I am delighted to be here at long last. Um, and it's a special pleasure to be here in the Rosie Silverman Abella moot courtroom uh, in the presence of the great woman herself. So thank you so much for coming, Rosie. Rosie and I first met in, at an International Bar Association World Woman Lawyers Conference in London in the 1990s. And I think I can say we've been friends ever since. So it's great to, to be here uh, and with you. But I'm not sure how well I qualify for uh, the David 
Goodman uh, Fellowship, because this is supposed to bring practicing lawyers into the faculty to share their practicing experience with the uh, students. Well, for the first 28 years of my professional life, I was either an academic or a law reformer, which is very much the same thing. Um, for the next 26 years, I was a full-time judge. So I spent hardly any of my life as a practicing lawyer. So I'm not sure I qualify for the fellowship, but I'm still very glad to be here. Uh, and I suppose judges are practicing lawyers, um, in fact. I've been practicing as a judge uh, for a very long time. And I've got a great deal to say. I'm afraid very UK focused, but I think the messages come out the same. Uh, so here goes. On Monday the 18th of July, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom moved the motion in the House of Commons that this House has confidence in Her Majesty's government. Detailing his government's achievements, he declared, quote, with grim determination, we saw off Brenda Hale and we got Brexit done, end quote. Neither the Speaker nor the Leader of the Opposition reacted, but this was a pretty jaw-dropping thing for a British Prime Minister to say. He was, of course, referring to the decision of the Supreme Court on the 24th of September 2019 that his advice to Her Majesty that Parliament should be prorogued was unlawful and of no effect. But he was, of course, wrong for at least five reasons. First, although it was Brenda Hale's job as president to announce the decision of the court, it was not her decision alone, but that of all the 11 justices who had heard the case, in effect, the whole court. And our former Prime Minister doesn't know much about the court if he thinks that the President can get her fellow justices to sign up to anything with which they disagree. They are an independent and strong-minded bunch, and we allow dissent in our court, but there was none. Second, neither I nor my fellow justices were trying to stop Brexit. That was not what the case was about. It was about the Prime Minister's attempts to prevent Parliament from performing its proper constitutional role in the Brexit process. But however often we say that, some politicians refuse to believe that we were standing up for Parliament and not frustrating Brexit. Third, the Prime Minister implied that he had ignored our decision, which he did not and could not. Parliament reassembled the very next day and went about its troublesome business. But the very suggestion that the government might ignore judicial decisions with which which it did not like, is extraordinary. Yet there have been examples recently of ministers refusing to obey court orders, and Dominic Raab, until last week, the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, has floated the idea of legislating expressly to give them just such a power. Fourth, the Prime Minister may even have implied that he was responsible for my departure from the Supreme Court in January 2020, which of course he was not. I retired at the beginning of the law term in which I would reach the mandatory retirement age of 75, something which had been announced months before our decision. But the very suggestion that the Prime Minister can remove a judge from office is the most shocking of all. Since the Act of Settlement of 1701, all senior judges hold office quam diu se bene gesserint, so long as she shall well behave herself therein, as it was put, to great hilarity in the House of Lords when I was sworn in as a Lord of Appeal in Ordinary in January 2004. Their Lordship thought it hilarious that I had to uh, behave myself. Uh, and uh, ministers can't remove them. And last, it was a bit rude, wasn't it? But I have some sympathy for that because I'd unwittingly been a bit rude to him when I had worn a sparkly spider brooch while announcing the prorogation decision. If only someone had told me that The Who had recorded a song called Boris the Spider. <laughs> Any of you know it? Well, if you do know it, and even if you don't, I can tell you that the spider comes to a very sticky end. So I should, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have worn the brooch. I'd have worn something else that they'd have made a fuss about, but there we go. Of course, the Prime Minister and other members of the government had long been critical of the prorogation decision. Jacob Rees-Mogg, then leader of the House of Commons, had called it a constitutional coup. Kwasi Kwarteng, then Minister of State for Business, Energy and Clean Growth, had accused the judges of bias. 
And even the then Attorney General, Sir Geoffrey Cox QC, had claimed that we had invented new law. And a few days later, the Prime Minister threatened consequences for the Supreme Court and suggested the political vetting of judges. This was all very troubling. It did suggest that Her Majesty's government were among the enemies of judicial independence. And in June this year, the all-party parliamentary group on democracy and the constitution published the results of their inquiry into the impact of the actions and rhetoric of the executive since 2016 on the constitutional role of the judiciary. It's well worth a read, incidentally, whether you agree with it or not. They quote Lord MacDonald QC, a former director of public prosecutions, who believes that, quote, a vogue for ministerial attacks on judicial decisions began in the late 1990s and early 2000s. This seemed to be part of New Labour's attempt to present itself as tough on crime. But it had paved the way for more egregious ministerial attitudes since, end quote. In the group's view, they had evolved from critique to attack with four characteristics, misrepresenting decisions or the reasons for them, suggesting that judges are biased, making threats against the judges, and, quote, conflating cases with political consequences with the courts determining political questions, end quote. And the group lists numerous examples. They found particularly worrying the involvement of the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, who swears an oath to respect the rule of law and defend the independence of the judiciary, and of the Attorney General, whose traditional role was to give independent legal advice uh, to government, regardless of the political consequences. They quote Sir Jonathan Jones QC, who resigned as head of the government legal service when the government announced its intention to break the Brexit agreement. Quote, there is a difference between law ministers attacking judges and ordinary ministers doing so. Historically, the law ministers have kept out of public debates save for when it became necessary publicly to defend judges. Now they are leading the criticism." End quote. The group cite a speech by Suella Braverman, when Attorney General, criticizing several Supreme Court decisions without, in the group's view, any substantial legal analysis. The group conclude that this is all constitutionally improper, suggesting that ministers know better than judges how to determine complex issues of law making unsubstantiated allegations about the motivation of judges, responding to adverse rulings by making threats, and undermining the citizens' respect for and allegiance to the law. But they also suggest something much more troubling. Last year, the then Lord Chancellor, Robert Buckland, in an article for the Daily Telegraph, commented that he believed that the judges had become more restrained since the backlash over the decision in the prorogation case. And in a speech to right of center think tank policy exchange, in which John Finnis is very influential, um, he claimed that the judges were exercising more restraint after being encouraged to do so by the executive. Or as policy exchange reported it, the Supreme Court had, quote, begun to correct some of the excesses of recent years, end quote. This prompted the group to review all the Supreme Court decisions in public law cases since my departure in January 2020. They found no less than seven out of approximately 40 in which the Supreme Court had departed from previous House of Lords or Supreme Court authority in favor of a position more in line with government thinking. These cases were on whether the court should take account of the UK's international obligations in interpreting statutes or developing the common law, on whether the courts could go beyond the case law of the European Court of Human Rights in interpreting the rights set out in the European Convention, on the legality of imposing a level of court fees which creates a real risk that people will be prevented from having access to justice, on the obligation to investigate historic deaths involving state agents, on the relationship between national security and the right to a fair trial, on the award of costs against a claimant who has refused permission to bring a claim for judicial review, and on whether the government should act in accordance with its international obligations when determining policy. 
In all seven of those cases, the court had reached a result and for reasons which at least on the surface appeared to differ from previous cases of the highest authority. Traditionally, the court has been very slow to depart from its previous decisions, so this is unusual, to say the least. The group's witnesses differed in their views of the reasons for this. Some thought that it was indeed a reaction to the criticisms and threats from government, but others thought that it was simply down to the change in membership of the court. Six of the 11 justices who took part in the prorogation decision have now retired, including four who were thought to be of a mentality which was more sympathetic to individual human rights and more willing to challenge the executive than some. The group does not take sides. Correlation does not necessarily equate to causation, they said. But they also said that the evidence, quote, creates a troubling impression in the light of the executive's recent approach towards the judiciary. The group are not alone in noticing a trend towards a more executive-minded Supreme Court. In the two years since I retired, the number of successful human rights cases has plummeted and the number of cases won by public bodies has soared. But post hoc doesn't necessarily mean propter hoc. My own view is that the changing membership of the court is the more likely explanation for the changing decisions. The background, life experiences, values and mentality of the judges has always had an impact upon how they approach their decisions. And the views of the most experienced of the justices are likely to be particularly influential when so many of them have been so recently appointed. Only the president and the deputy president have been in post for more than five years. But it is startling that a body of parliamentarians representing all four of the main political parties should be taking the view that, even in the United Kingdom, which has so long prided itself on the quality of its judiciary, the independence of the judiciary is under threat, perhaps even from within, and needs to be safeguarded in future legislation. There is, of course, another side to the argument. Policy Exchange, in a post by Professor Richard Eakins, who heads their Judicial Power Project, has hit back. He accuses the all-party group of a, quote, modus operandi of a subset of the legal profession, which is to weaponize judicial independence for political advantage, not only to score points off the government, but now also to shame and browbeat the judges themselves. So he's accusing the all-party group of doing what the all-party group is accusing the government of doing. There's nothing in the report, it is said, which warrants the conclusion that judges or judicial independence are under attack. So perhaps the group itself is among the enemies of judicial independence. Now, I'm not taking sides in that dispute, but it does raise three questions. What do we mean by the independence of the judiciary? How do we secure it? And why should we secure it? At its most basic level, the independence of the judiciary means that the justice system is a separate and independent branch of government. It decides disputes between individuals and enterprises, it enforces the criminal law, and it ensures that the executive branch of government acts within the powers which the law has given it and respects the human rights of everyone within the jurisdiction. To do this, it needs decision makers who are able, in the words of our judicial oath, to do right to all manner of people according to the laws and usages of this realm without fear or favor, affection or ill will. This means both impartiality between the parties appearing in court and neutrality as to the result. It means that the judiciary must not be corrupt, either in the narrow sense of taking bribes or in the broader sense of being susceptible to favours or threats. And it means that the judiciary are not the servants of the government. They must be free to decide the case in accordance with the law and not in the way that the government wants. They must not be subject to any overt or covert coercion from government. They must not be under pressure from politicians of any stripe. If the government wins the case, it must be because it has won the argument. So how do we secure this independence? At the very least, the judges must not be afraid that they will lose their jobs if they make decisions which are against the government or unpopular with some politicians or with the media or with the general public. Judges in the United Kingdom do have security of tenure in this sense. 
Senior judges can only be removed by a petition of both Houses of Parliament to the monarch. Less senior judges can be removed by the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, but only with the consent of the Lord Chief Justice or the senior president of tribunals. In practice, there's now a formal disciplinary process leading up to any sort of sanction against a judge who misbehaves. On those very rare occasions when dismissal might be appropriate, as when a judge was caught smuggling alcohol on his yacht across the channel, uh, the judge can usually be persuaded to resign. And it's even harder to dispose of a judge who is simply not up to the job. But security of tenure is not enough. It's necessary to pay the judges enough, not only to deter them from taking bribes, but also to encourage them to work hard enough. This is a sore point in many jurisdictions, but not recently in the UK, but not until recently in the UK. Judicial salaries in the UK are attractive to people like me, whose previous career was in academia and the public service, but they're not so attractive to the successful advocates who have traditionally been regarded as the best candidates for the best judicial jobs. The better qualified a person may appear to be to become a top judge, the less attractive the salary and other benefits may be to that person. One attraction used to be the judicial pension, but the government changed the rules in a way which made it a great deal less attractive and also affected people who had already accepted appointment on the basis of the former pension scheme. For a while, it became extremely difficult to attract high-quality candidates for the bench. Revisions to the pension scheme have improved things considerably, but the episode led to a breakdown of trust between the government and the judiciary, which was hard to repair. And this leads on to another thorny issue. The justice system, to be independent, must have sufficient resources to be able to do its job properly. The Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice has to swear an oath to discharge my duty to ensure the provision of resources for the efficient and effective support of the courts for which I am responsible. Yet the UK justice system, especially in England, was cut to the bone during the years of austerity which followed the financial crash of 2008. Courts were closed and their buildings sold off. People outside London and the other big cities often have to travel a very long way to get to court. Many of the courts which remain are in very poor repair. They're also understaffed without enough ushers, clerks, and other administrative backup, let alone security. Perhaps most serious of all, court sitting days were artificially rationed so that a backlog of cases awaiting trial built up even before COVID came along to make it even harder to try them. It's not been all bad news. Money's been spent on computerizing some court processes, Court bundles are now digitized and largely accessed on screen. The mounds of paper which used to accompany any substantial case have mostly disappeared. Every court and tribunal is equipped for remote hearings. COVID made us all realize how much could be done just as effectively remotely as it could face to face. But for a while, cases which really ought to be done face to face were being done remotely and some still are. And nothing was done to make it easier for ordinary litigants who don't all have computers, and some of whom may not even have smartphones, to take part in remote hearings. It all adds up to a general impression of a justice system which is not taken as seriously as it should be by government. And it leads to the judges feeling powerless to influence how their work is organized. There are justice systems elsewhere in the world which are entirely run by the judiciary. The government gives them a budget, and the court decides how it should be spent and employs the staff to run it. This must give the courts more independence in deciding on priorities. It's perhaps less likely that sitting days will be artificially restricted, for example. It should also make it clear that the staff owe their loyalty to the justice system which employs them rather than to the government machine. I don't for one moment suggest that the staff in Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, sorry, His Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, are not loyal servants of the justice system but it is HMCTS rather than the judiciary which calls the shots. On the other hand, people who are well qualified to be judges are not necessarily well qualified to run a justice system. And there's still no guarantee that the government will allocate sufficient resources for them to do so. Another crucial ingredient in securing judicial independence is the way in which the judges are appointed. There are many different ways of doing this and I'm not going to suggest that ours in the UK is the only or even the best way. 
The prior and fundamental question is how far judicial appointments should be influenced by political considerations. The answer which most lawyers in the United Kingdom would probably give is not at all. Before the Second World War, political considerations certainly played a part in some appointments. It used to be the custom for the Attorney General, a member of Parliament, to be appointed Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales when a vacancy arose. The Lord Chancellor of the day, also a politician, played a crucial role in all judicial appointments, making the more junior ones directly and recommending the more senior ones to the Crown. But it is generally believed that political considerations did not play a part in the Lord Chancellor's decisions after the Second World War. The Labour government of 1945 to 1951 would have found it hard to appoint many judges who supported the Labour Party. Indeed, one of their most successful appointments was Lord Reid, a Scotsman who'd been a Conservative MP until appointed directly to the House of Lords. I myself owed my first judicial appointments, two judicial appointments, as a part-time judge in the Crown and County Courts and as a High Court judge to Conservative Lord Chancellors, and my second two as a Lord Justice of Appeal and as a Lord of Appeal in Ordinary to Labour Lord Chancellors. And I can honestly say that I did not know the political affiliations, if any, of most of my colleagues in the House of Lords and Supreme Court. One had been Solicitor General for Scotland in a Conservative government, and another had co-authored a book with a prominent Conservative politician, so I could make a good guess. But with most of the others, I couldn't. A pro-government mentality in public law cases doesn't necessarily indicate any particular party political affiliation. Statist attitudes are just as prevalent on the left as they are on the right. Since the 2005 Constitutional Reform Act, all judicial appointments have been recommended by an independent appointing commissions who have a duty to make their recommendations solely on merit. They employ open and transparent application-based processes with published competences and a variety of methods of assessing these. Save in large-scale recruitment exercises, they make one recommendation per vacancy. In England and Wales, the Lord Chancellor has three options, yes, no, or persuade me. If he doesn't say yes, he has to give reasons, which may be judicially reviewed. In practice, he may talk some time about it, but he says yes. The scope for introducing political considerations is practically nil. Indeed, there are people who think that we have gone too far in that direction. The Lord Chancellor is no longer a senior lawyer and a top-ranking member of the cabinet. He or she need no longer be a lawyer at all. Dominic Raab regarded it as demotion when he was transferred from the Foreign Office. There are far fewer lawyers in Parliament than there used to be. There is less understanding of the justice system and its importance in the whole scheme of government. Would it not be a good idea, say some, if there were more political involvement in appointments so that the politicians could feel more invested in the system and at least know more about it? Some have suggested, for example, that the commission which recommends appointments to the Supreme Court should put up more than one candidate so that the government has a choice, as I believe is the case in Canada. But the judges would be vehemently against this. I got a lot of criticism when I mildly suggested that the commissions for appointing Supreme Court justices might be enlarged from five to seven by including a senior politician, one from Her Majesty's government and one from Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Even that was too much politics, apparently. Now, the question of politicians' involvement in judicial appointments is particularly complicated in countries with a written constitution, which includes a Bill of Rights, which is most of the countries in the westernized world. For then, the Supreme Court can override the will of the currently elected legislature. This is not the case in the United Kingdom, where the currently elected legislature can always overturn a judicial decision which it doesn't like, although it hardly ever does so. I understand that there is a view in Canada that greater use should be made of the constitutional power to legislate notwithstanding any incompatibility with the charter rights, which would produce a similar effect. But in countries where the top court has the final word, packing the court with, judicial with political appointments is a way of retaining power even when voted out of government or legislature. Independence from both is secured at the price of democratic legitimacy. Complicated though the question is, it seems to me 
that the greater the power of the court over the will of the elected legislatures, the more important it is that political considerations do not play a part in the appointment of judges to the court. But that leads on to the last question. Why should we want an independent judiciary? These days, we tend to treat the answer as self-evident. The separation of judicial power from legislative and executive power is an essential part of a modern constitution. But why is it so self-evident? Objections come from two directions. In authoritarian regimes, the courts may simply be seen as a convenient mechanism for enforcing the laws. It's striking that throughout history and throughout the world, even the most dictatorial of governments have seen the benefit of having courts to enforce their laws. This may mean that the courts are in the pocket of the governing, governing power and will invariably do as it wishes, but it does not also do so. And it certainly doesn't mean that the courts have to be arbitrary in their decision making. King John promised in Magna Carta in 1215 that he would only appoint judges who knew the law and intended to abide by it. It's important to instill respect for the laws in the general population. It's important to reassure the law abiding that they will not be punished if they obey the laws. So it also matters that such courts are fair in their decision making processes. King John also promised in Magna Carta that no one was to be condemned but by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Yet the king's judges could scarcely be seen as independent in the modern sense, nor was the king's regime any sort of democracy. Throughout much of European history, the judges could be seen as doing a reasonably good job in the fair administration of justice without being institutionally independent of government. And even if they thought the regime illegitimate, as Chief Justice Hale, no relation, uh, did of Cromwell's regime in the 17th century. They might believe it more important that the administration of justice was carried on. The institutional independence of the judiciary can also take many forms. We still find it strange that in much of continental Europe, judges and prosecutors are part of the same profession, and people may move seamlessly between the two. Hence, as Julian Assange found, a European arrest warrant issued by a Swedish prosecutor could be regarded as having been issued by a judicial authority, something which two of us in the UK Supreme Court found unpalatable. Yet it should not be suggested that the courts in continental Europe are any less independent in their decision making than are the courts in the common law world. Objections to judicial independence in my country come from a rather different perspective. It is suggested that the courts are not sufficiently democratic. Thus, there are objections to unelected judges subverting the will of the democratically elected politicians who govern us. Many of the criticisms of the judiciary mentioned by the all-party parliamentary group are of this type. For example, in 2013, Theresa May, then the Home Secretary, accused the judges who made decisions in immigration cases with which she disagreed as subverting democracy. In 2016, Dominic Raab, then a junior minister in the Ministry of Justice, described the decision of the High Court in the first of our two big Brexit cases as an unholy alliance of die-hard Remain campaigners, a fund manager, and an unelected judiciary, which had thwarted the wishes of the British people. Such comments come not only from politicians, but also from serious academics and think tanks, and even occasionally in the course of legal argument. In a case called A and the Secretary of State for the Home Department in 2004, colloquially known as the Belmarsh case, after the prison in which foreign suspected terrorists were held in indefinite detention ordered by the government, the House of Lords was called upon to decide whether the legislation which permitted this was compatible with the right to liberty protected by the European Convention on Human Rights. The UK had derogated from that right, but derogation was only permitted where there was an emergency threatening the life of the nation, and even then, only to the extent strictly required by the exigencies of the situation. The majority of the nine law lords were content to accept the judgment of government that there was indeed an emergency threatening the life of the nation in the wake of the atrocities of the 11th of September 2001. But the Attorney General also argued 
that only the democratic organs of the state, that is the government and parliament, were qualified to assess whether the measure was strictly required by the exigencies of the situation. Lord Bingham, the senior law lord, disagreed. Quote, I do not accept the distinction the Attorney General drew between democratic institutions and the courts. It is, of course, true that the judges in this country are not elected and are not answerable to Parliament. It is, of course, true that Parliament, the executive, and the courts have different functions. But the functions of independent judges charged to interpret and apply the law is universally recognised as a cardinal feature of the modern democratic state, a cornerstone of the rule of law itself. The Attorney General is fully entitled to insist on the proper limits of judicial authority, but he is wrong to stigmatise judicial decision-making as in some way undemocratic. Quite so. UK judges may not be elected or accountable to Parliament, but they are an essential component of democratic government, and they are accountable. Most of their decisions are reached after a public hearing. They must give reasons for their decisions, and these are published, even if the hearing has been in private and their decisions are subject to the possibility of an appeal to a higher court. They're also expected to behave in a way which is worthy of the respect of the government, of the litigants and their lawyers, and of the general public. In other words, they have to do their job well. They have to merit their independence. In return for their independence, the judges do have to accept the limits of their role. An important part of that role in a modern democracy is ensuring that ministers, the government, and other public authorities act within the limits of the powers granted them by law, and at least under the current UK Human Rights Act, do not act in a way which is incompatible with the rights set out in the European Convention. In an ordinary re judicial review of administrative action, they must not confuse a judgment on the legality of that action and a judgment on its merits. In human rights cases, they have a delicate task in deciding which judgments should properly be left to government and parliament and which judgments are properly within their sphere of competence. As Lord Hodge, now Deputy President of the Supreme Court, has put it extrajudicially, there are decisions of policy which involve social, economic or political preferences that are properly the domain of the elected branches of government. Not only do the courts lack the resources to formulate policy and assess the practical consequences of decisions in such matters, but also the courts cannot be politically accountable for them in a democracy. I agree entirely with that as a matter of principle. For example, in the Belmarsh case, I too agreed that it was for the government and parliament to judge whether there was an emergency threatening the life of the nation after 9-11. And in another case, I agreed that it was not for us to question the judgment of the Foreign Office, that allowing a prominent Iranian dissident to come to the UK to address parliamentarians in the Palace of Westminster would do unacceptable damage to our already fragile relations with Iran. But on the other hand, I disagreed with the majority that the government had given sufficient reasons for the discrimination involved in denying certain households with children the benefits that which the government itself accepted that they needed. Applying the principle of institutional competence in practice is not always clear cut, and it is the most difficult issue facing an independent judiciary. I suspect that differences in the application of that principle are the main reason for the recent trend in UK Supreme Court decisions. Not so much a matter of political pressure, but of judicial mentality. Lord Reid, the current president, has indeed suggested that, quote, a greater respect for the separation of powers, end quote, may be the explanation. I believe that the greatest enemy of the independence of our judiciary is the sheer lack of knowledge amongst politicians, the media, and the general public about the justice system, what it is, and what it is for. An Ipsos poll in May this year found that 59% had a great deal, or a fair amount, of confidence in the UK Supreme Court to do its job well. Amongst those who knew a great deal or a fair amount about the court, this rose to 84%, which is pretty gratifying. Whereas it fell to 52% amongst the rest, no doubt partly because they knew so little. 
but 65% of respondents knew not very much about or had never heard of the court, which is very alarming. So how can we address this? The court has always maintained friendly links with the relevant parliamentary committees and with the Lord Chancellor. But these were always about general developments of common interest, not about the decision-making in the court. I'm rather troubled that the Economist should report that the president of the court has been responding to criticism by, quote, patiently reassuring MPs that he understands the court's role, end quote. The court has also always done its best to reach out to the public through live streaming its hearings, through issuing its judgments in various user-friendly ways, and through an educational program. But we should all be doing our utmost to interest the general public in the law and the legal system, to explain what it is we do, why we do it, and why it is important for everyone. This is what my next book will try to do. In the meantime, I still believe that, despite some of its enemies, judicial independence is alive and well in the United Kingdom, as I am sure that it is in Canada. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lot in there, and I want to, um, before I turn the floor open to questions, um, acknowledge, as Lady Hale already did, that we do have, in fact, the moot courtroom being named after Rosia Bella. So Rosia Bella is sitting right there in the second row, first row of seats. And we also have here two panelists um, for tomorrow's roundtable event, Lord Dyson and Justice Susanna Baer from the German um, federal uh, constitutional court and their spouses, so we're very, very happy to have them here. And I saw each of them scribbling notes as they were listening to Lady Hale. So I want to encourage again the students in particular to ask questions, but icebreakers could be faculty or could be judges, including from the continent if you'd like to. But anybody um, uh, who do want, does want to ask a question, if you wouldn't mind going to the microphone, simply because that's how um, your voice can be projected and we're also broadcasting this um, online. and so. That's how we can make sure that everybody can hear your questions. So the floor is open. Please. So if, um, go ahead. Should be on. Thank you, Lady Hill. Um, I have lots to ask about the media relationship with the courts, but I want to put that aside because I was interested in why the court found a prorogation um, decision justiciable. So these kinds of decisions are typically Thank you again, Lady Hill. Um, I was wondering if you could explain why the decision to, pro to prorogue was justiciable. Um, in Canada, it would, I think, be considered, or has been considered, non-justiciable. Um, and I gather your courts probably would have considered it non-justiciable. I could be corrected. Um, and your lower court, in this case, certainly found it non-justiciable. So I'm wondering what thinking was about taking this step and reviewing a decision to prorogue parliament, it, was, it seemed unprecedented. So I'm wondering what went through your judicial minds collectively and individually to move in that direction. Well, and if I could just yeah. interrupt for one second. So this is Professor David Schneiderman, member of faculty. I'm just gonna take the second question as well. If you briefly introduce yourself and keep the question tight, and then we'll give Lady Monty Hale the opportunity. Mercy, who attended this place many, many, many years ago. First of all, my compliments to your talk. And my big takeaway, which I find most compelling, is the lack of knowledge. And I'm going to reference indirectly Walter Badgett, mm -hmm. who spoke about the monarchy in terms of there needs to be, to a degree, the mysterium tremendum in terms of maintaining respect and the integrity and ontology of the institution. 
And how do you balance that in terms of opening it up too much and at the same time ensuring that deference is maintained? Because the veneer is so thin between civility and anarchy. And after spending the past six months in Congo, where the gangsters rule supreme, hence the shorts, I'm still trying to hold on to what I call, in terms of uh, refined comfort, mm -hmm. is that when you see it, that civility is razor thin. We do not know how fortunate we are, and it can turn on a pivot. I've seen it, I've witnessed it, people that are very comfortable, respectful, law-abiding, and then the next hour, they're actually mm -hmm. going tooth and tongue. And this is in the eastern part of DRC, where mm -hmm. they're alleging that the United Nations is not doing what it ought to be doing. But my big issue is the lack of knowledge. And that raises for me an issue epistemic. Thank you. Mm, thank you. All right, so there you go. There we go. OK, right. Um, it's an insulting reply, and I don't mean to be impertinent. Uh, but the answers are all there in the judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but to, to be a little bit uh, clearer, uh, yet the High Court in England and Wales had decided that the issue was non-justiciable. The inner house of the Court of Session in Scotland had decided not only that it was justiciable, but that the decision was unlawful and of no effect. So according to England and Wales, Parliament had been prorogued. According to Scotland, Parliament had not been prorogued. They couldn't both be right. We had to make a choice between them. And we drew what we hoped was a clear distinction which had been drawn in the case law for a long time between the existence and extent of a prerogative power and its exercise. There was a decision in the 1990s that held that even the exercise of a prerogative power might be susceptible to judicial review. But it has always been the case that the existence and extent of a prerogative power has been subject to judicial review. And in our view, this was a case about the existence and extent of the prerogative power. Because it's one thing to say that the government of the day can suspend all parliamentary operations for a matter of a few days in preparation for the start of a new session by the Queen's speech. It is quite another thing to say that the government of the day can suspend all parliamentary operations for five weeks out of the eight weeks running up to the date when the UK would inevitably leave the European Union unless something were done to extend the deadline. And during those eight weeks, an enormous amount of legislative activity was necessary in any event. So it was an extraordinary thing to do. Uh, and we did acknowledge that it might be within the limits of the prerogative power if there were a compelling reason to do it. We hadn't been given any reason at all to do it. We had one memorandum from Nikki da Costa, who was the number 10 um, head of parliamentary affairs, uh, who said, well, October the 14th has been in the Queen's diary as the date for the next Queen's speech for months. So we're obviously working up to that. So why don't we suspend Parliament five weeks earlier without saying any reason? for doing that. There was absolutely no reason. Um, and so we were not confronted with a situation in which we were given a complicated political explanation for the reasons, although we could obviously guess them, but we weren't given any of that. And poor Jonathan Jones, who was the head of the government legal service at the time, whose job it was when there's a judicial review to write round all the government departments saying, we've got a duty of candor, we've got to uh, disclose all the relevant documents that any government department has. So, of course, he writes to number 10 saying, <laughs> bring out your dead, so to speak. Um, and uh, that's all he had. Those, uh, well, that memo from Nikki da Costa and um, the Prime Minister uh, say, oh, yes, well, why not? You know, the, the um, September sitting was only um, 
only introduced because of that uh, girly swat, David Cameron, <laughs> um, who thought we ought to be earning our crust. So that was all there was. Um, so we didn't have what would have been a rather more difficult question if we had been given some real reasons for doing it. I still think we would have reached the same conclusion um, because the accountability of government to parliament and the necessity of parliament to legislate um, are two crucial features of the Constitution. So I think we would have reached the same conclusion. Um, but that's, that's the explanation. Um, not difficult, not difficult. Perhaps jump in before you answer the second question, and this is uh, for the benefit of, um, I suspect, some of the students here, mm -hmm. especially students in first year, who may mm -hmm. not actually know exactly what the prorogation case was about yes. and, and what the issue in it was and how it related to the whole Brexit debate. Are you able to give us like a tiny little nutshell? Well, well I've, tr I've tried to explain. Um, the, the Prime Minister decided uh, that he would advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament as I say, for five out of the eight weeks remaining before uh, the UK would inevitably leave the uh, European Union unless something were done to extend the deadline. Um, and this was an extraordinary length of time for which to suspend uh, Parliament. Uh, the, there's a, um, an important distinction between Parliament being in recess and Parliament being prorogued. Parliament that's in recess is simply not sitting, but it can get on with its other job and it can come and sit, you know, if it's decided so to do. Parliament that's prorogued can't do anything, um, basically anything important. Um, and so it was suspending the whole operation of Parliament. Now, Parliament was being jolly difficult. It really was being obstreperous. Um, so uh, it was convenient, to say the least, uh, to, um, to, to shut it down. Uh, but it was subverting the Constitution because the main role of Parliament is, as I say, to hold government accountable and to legislate, both of which were necessary during this period. Um, and we had evidence from uh, Sir John Major, the former Prime Minister, that the standard period of a prorogation leading up to a Queen's speech was at most five days. At most. And in fact, it really doesn't have to be as long as that. Um, so this five weeks, there was, we've given no reason why it was necessary to do it for five weeks, other than the girly swap reason. Um, ironic so. way, this was actually also about honouring the powers of Parliament as it, it opposed was, to it the was entirely, independence of Parliament. It was entirely as to about judiciary. supporting the powers of Parliament. The same was true of the first of the two big Brexit cases that we had, because this was about whether the government could give notice to leave the European Union without parliamentary authority so to do. And of course, under our dualist system, the government, it's within the royal prerogative or the prerogative uh, to make treaties and to unmake treaties. So on the face of it, yes, they could, but it is not within the power of the government to change the law. And the automatic effect of our leaving the European Union would have been to make dramatic changes in the law and remove a whole source of lawmaking from the UK's constitution. Uh, now, the three dissenters, we, we were 11-3 in that case, and the three dissenters took the view that that power was inherent in the European Communities Act uh, 1972 that took us into the uh, European Union, and that is a completely respectable point of statutory construction. Um, but the rest of us thought, come on, stand back. Do you really think that when Parliament passed the European Communities Act, uh, getting us into the European Union with the dramatic effects that it had, they thought that the government could just take us out of it without Parliament having any say in the matter at all? Um, it did not seem to us that that was the way in which Parliament expected the 1972 Act to be construed. Um, so that was what that case was about. Both of the cases were about reaffirming the constitutional authority of Parliament as against the government. Really important, but difficult to get across. Um, so thank you. That's, yes. So I'll give you time if you want to respond to the second questioner, and I'll give others the opportunity to use that time to come up to the mics and ask more questions. Well, I'm glad to think 
that you take the view that lack of knowledge is the most important issue because, as you'll have gathered from my lengthy uh, <laughs> kind of examination of what all the problems might be, uh, I think that that is the most important uh, issue. Uh, this question about whether we need mystery in order to uh, keep respect uh, and Bagot's view that there were certain elements of the Constitution which had to be mysterious uh, to keep the, the mystique. Um, up to a point, I think that may be true and has traditionally, until quite recently, been true of the monarchy, but not of all elements of the Constitution. Um, I do not myself think it is appropriate for Parliament to be clouded in mystery. I don't think it's appropriate for the courts to be clouded in mystery. The courts have got to earn the respect. They've got to behave properly, <laughs> which is part of what I was saying. But I don't think that they should be shrouded in mystery, uh, at least in a modern Western democracy. And it's rather important that they're not. And one of the unfortunate things, it's probably not as true in Canada as it is in the UK, is that we don't have anywhere in our educational system anything about the justice system, what it is for and what it does and why it's important to everybody. Most people know a little bit about the criminal justice system and they think that's what the law's all about. And they love the courtroom dramas on television and they love the murder mysteries and there's a brilliant book just been written by a retired old Bailey judge about um, unlawful killings. It's an absolutely wonderful book. Now, that's all great. But what they don't know about is the everyday work of the courts, which is deciding whether they're entitled to disability benefits, deciding where a child's going to live when a couple separate, deciding whether a debt should be paid or not paid, deciding whether somebody should be evicted from their home. All of these everyday things which matter to everybody and could leap out of the woodwork at you at any time. That's the thing that people don't understand, and that's what I think we've got to spend a little bit of time trying to get across in as jolly and as helpful a way as possible. But my other thing is our history curriculum does not include the 17th century. Now, I happen to believe that the 17th century is the most important century in British constitutional history for obvious reasons. You know? <laughs> That's when we had our revolution. That's when we killed our king. That's when we established constitutional monarchy. That's when the basic elements of our constitution were established. That's when the independence of the judiciary was established, and all of that. And our kids know nothing about it, which I think is a great shame. So those are my various campaigns for the future. Yeah. Lady Hale, thank you very much for your, your talk. Um, I would be curious, and you might be reluctant to comment, um, on the politics of judicial independence to our neighbors in the South. Um, I think David uh, pointed, pointed to this movement of common, common good constitutionalism as an attack on judicial independence from the right. But there is also a very strong attack on judicial independence from the left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, someone like Samuel Moyne at Yale is very prominent in this. And I think one of the things that makes it particularly interesting in the United States is the United States has a constitution that is very um, intentionally counter-majoritarian in and of itself, in which mm -hmm. several institutions are set up to thwart the formation of democratic majorities. And so then you have layered on top of that the additional problem of an extremely counter-majoritarian judiciary. Mm. And you know, you probably, uh, there's no reason why you would sort of follow in detail all the cases that have been coming out of the United States Supreme Court in the last year um, that many people view as quite dangerous for the future of democracy. Mm. Um, so if you, if you want to pass, I understand that might be delicate, but I would like to hear your views on it if possible. <laughs> Well, I tried to be as delicate as I could when I was pointing out that in those countries with a constitution where a court has the last word, there is this tension between um, the, the, the wishes of the currently elected um, government and legislature 
and the, the views of a court which has been appointed by earlier executives or in a different way, possibly for political reasons, which undoubtedly is what happens in the United States. So we do now have a Supreme Court in the United States which uh, has a majority which has been appointed uh, by presidents of one political party um, who can make decisions which are contrary to the, uh, one assumes, the views of uh, what happens to be the current um, uh, legislature and executive. And of course one can say that this is good because the majority should not prevail. But equally one can say you've got a situation where a political body um, chosen under one political um, philosophy is dominating over elect currently elected bodies uh, who happen to espouse a different political philosophy. It's a, it's a complicated question. We in the United Kingdom don't have to face that, that question because we don't have that power. But I, I did express the view that the greater the power of the, uh, the court to be counter-majoritarian, to uphold certain values in the face of the wishes of the majority, the more important it is that they are not appointed for political reasons. And they're appointed in a more independent and neutral way. And then they really can act as a check and balance upon the wishes of the majority, which is what they're, the reason for having them. That would be my view, but of course it's not the view that happens to be in that jurisdiction. Um, <laughs> and yes, I have been keeping up. <laughs> okay, so there's still plenty of time. I see somebody coming, coming up, so I do have a question in the back pocket, but even better if you're going to ask one. And introduce yourself briefly. Hi, Lady Hill. My name is Gordon Milne. Um, I'm a second year student here at the, the faculty. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, you touched on a little bit the role that the court has in sort of furthering the knowledge that, among the population about the role of the court and how it works. I'm curious, do you have any comments about other members of the legal profession? Um, I think I've spoken to several of my peers who had the same experience I did this summer which was that all of a sudden, all of our friends and relations were asking us about how this recent Supreme Court of Canada case turned down and what, what is the logic of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, what is your role, what is your view of the role of other members of the legal profession and especially students um, in sort of advancing that knowledge of the judiciary among the broader population as well? Oh, well, what a, what a nice question. Um, I, I, I think it is the role of the legal profession generally um, and of, uh, I would include law students in that, uh, to try and explain to people um, whether they ask or not um, you know, what, what the law is, what the justice system does and indeed the effect of uh, recent decisions. Um, the only, uh, and certainly the official professional bodies in the UK have been very vocal about quite a lot of issues. Um, not only going on strike, which currently the barristers are doing in, in England, um, but uh, they've been very vocal on a lot of issues, uh, and that is right. The problem that the legal profession has is that the general public says, oh, they're only in it for the money, and the reason that they're banging on about this particular issue is that they want to get even richer than they already are. Um, the general public seems to have woken up to the fact that most junior barristers in criminal cases in England actually scarcely make the minimum wage uh, from their fees. I think people have woken up to these things. So if you bang on about it enough, <laughs> it can get home to the general public. Uh, there is a risk in trying to explain judgments, isn't there? I'm afraid. Especially if you're a law student. No. You won't always get it right. Um, not that we always get it right, either. Uh, one of the things that we do in the Supreme Court in the UK is, obviously, we produce our mega judgment, which 
even the one written over the weekend, you know, was 70 paragraphs long. Um, it took me, I was asked to read it out loud, the whole thing, for one of our radio channels, and I did. It took three quarters of an hour. Um, but we also produce, usually, a two-page summary, which is absolutely deadpan. It's not, hooray, the Supreme Court reached this amazing decision which does this, that, and the other. It's a deadpan decision. These were the facts, this was the issue, this was the decision, and these were the brief reasons for it. Um, and I do think that's a very good tool uh, because you know, anybody can get it off the net and you know, any law student who is asked, well, uh, this is what I think, but this is what the court says. And it's only two pages, at most three. You know, um, and, and it can be, be read. So, yes, I think, I think it's a mission that uh, everybody who is interested in the law, believes in the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, separation of powers, should try and, um, should try and help to get across. The more of you, the better. Well, so there we, yes, please. Oh, now I'm really yeah, frightened. Now, now I'm really frightened. <laughs> I, I'm John Dyson, Lord, Lord Dyson. Uh, I thank you very much, Brenda, for that very lucid and interesting lecture. Um, I, I, I should explain that I was, for two or three years, a colleague of uh, Lady Hale in the Supreme Court. I was also, before that, a colleague of hers for a short time in our Court of Appeal, and I ended up as effectively the president of our Court of Appeal of England and Wales. I was very interested to hear what you said about the seven out of 40 cases mm. in which uh, previous decisions of the Supreme Court had been reversed in recent times. And that seems to me to be rather disturbing because it, it suggests that there is a certain degree of instability in the court. And I think you were suggesting that the reason for this, or the, perhaps the principal reason for this, uh, was the uh, the judicial mentality, a change of judicial mentality mm. uh, in the court as now, as compared with it as it was fairly recently. Um, and I just wondered whether uh, there was anything that can be done about this, if, if you think that, as I infer that you do, that this is really not a very desirable state of affairs. Uh, my um, experience, and I, I did quite a lot of work on our Judicial Appointments Commission, was that the Judicial Appointments Commission, which appointed or recommended the appointments of senior, senior judges, uh, never explored the question of whether a judge, of the temperament of a judge, whether the mentality of a judge was uh, pro-establishment or anti-establishment, statist or not statist, and so on. That simply never mm. figured in any of the considerations, so far as I can recall. Uh, and so I just wondered whether there is, if you, if you, if you believe that this is a bit of a problem, what, if anything, can be done about it? Mm, yes. Well, that's an excellent question, isn't it? Um, the, the phenomenon which I described is undoubtedly correct. Uh, reversing is possibly not, is putting it too high, but departing from the essential reasoning in some earlier cases is what's been is what has happened. And the seven cases are fairly, two or three of them are really clear about this. Um, I would be very reluctant to uh, accept that this was because of all the nasty things government ministers have been saying about the court. Uh, you will have gathered I was. Others are saying that, but I'm really reluctant to say that because I would hate to think that our judges were not sufficiently robust to decide in accordance with their consciences and judicial oath, rather than because of the nasty things the government had been saying. So I do think it's more likely that it is the particular um, cast of judicial mind uh, amongst the um, current members of the court, coupled with their comparative inexperience, as I mentioned. It's just so happened that all nine of the justices 
coming from England and Wales. We have two from Scotland, one from Northern Ireland, and nine from England and Wales. All nine of them have been replaced in the last five years, some of them more than once. So it does mean that it's a comparatively inexperienced court. Um, and I think it, that does have an effect because it takes time, as you and I both know, to think oneself into the role of the top court, uh, which is much freer to act in accordance with principle rather than with prior authority, because we're not bound by the previous authority of the Court of Appeal. Um, whereas poorer the Court of Appeal has got to spend half its time discovering what the previous Court of Appeal decisions meant, um, extracting some principle from them when this is very hard to do, and then eventually making a decision. Uh, I'm right about that, aren't I? It's really, that's what, most of it, whereas you don't have to do that. You, you can stand back a bit more um, because there's very little that's binding upon you. But on the other hand, there is some previous authority, so it's very rare to be uh, departing from it with quite the, and in one or two of the cases, with some vehemence, has to be said. Not just doing it, but doing it with um, some force. Um, so that is, that is rare, but I would like to believe that it's mentality rather than... Um, rather than pressure, and a bit of inexperience. I would have liked to have seen some dissent in, in some of those cases. And that's what was missing. Um, but it's really difficult, isn't it, to think that an appointing commission would say, well, look, here's a case. What would you do about it? Um, the, in the United States, all the candidates in their selection you know, their, their vetting processes, you know, became very skilled about dodging questions about legal issues. They didn't, they didn't answer anything about what they thought about Roe against Wade and so on and so forth. And I think if one started asking questions about it, it would probably um, turn into a bit of a charade. You can judge from the judgments because People who are candidates for the Supreme Court in the UK, they have to put in an application. So they have a CV and they have a statement saying how they think they match up to the qualities that we're asking for. And they have to put in evidence in the form of pieces of written work. Most people put in two judgments and an extrajudicial um, piece of writing. And they have to have referees who speak to their qualities and so on, and with hopefully evidence about how they match the qualities. So we go through all of that. So you can get some idea of how they approach questions from, from these things. Um, but you, I don't recall that we ever started asking questions about, you know, you're faced with this particular problem, what would you do about it, type questions. I don't think we ever did that. Um, and we didn't often, I mean, I have to confess, you see, I chaired the appointing commission, which is responsible for half the current members of the <laughs> Supreme Court of the <laughs> United Kingdom. So, um, so who am I, really, um, uh, to be saying? But um, on the whole, we, we were trying to be as objective as we could about how people matched up to the, to the criteria. Um, so there we go. So I'll put everyone on notice that after the question that's on tap already, there's opportunity for one more. So think now and well, yes, please. You've got, you've uh, got Susanna. Yes, there. no, Susanna is, is first. And so I'm delighted to see that the, I'm not surprised that the topic of judicial independence has got former and current justices uh, fired up. So please. But, but it's really the joy of uh, comparative reasoning on, on issues which affect all of us around the world. So mm -hmm. thank you first, Brenda, for uh, this uh, alarming, I think, alarming uh, contribution to this global discussion. Um, and I was inspired by the question of you, I think, uh, regarding the task of students, but also of academics generally, or anybody in the room, uh, to, to counter that. And, and uh, as usual, Brenda is a very British person and being very polite and, you know, not saying, you know, this is outrageous, these comments. These are not to be ever taken or accepted, and you didn't call for any sort of, you know, revolution taking to the streets, defend the courts. 
And I say that because in Poland, when the constitutional tribunal there was entirely destroyed, people actually took to the courts, particularly uh, to the streets, particularly women took to the streets because what did they fear of and what uh, was then the reality? That abortion would go down the drain first and secondly, maybe gay rights or religious freedom, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason why we're discussing all this is not to be, to not be understood as a current justice at our constitutional court is not defending these institutions or the people up there with their privilege and power, but because we do care about the protection of fundamental rights. When these comments, these aggressive comments on courts uh, take more hold and when courts are more destroyed or captured, what's, it, what's gonna be lost is all of our fundamental rights. So what are we supposed to do? One is, I think, and my experience in Germany is, that it should be one criteria to select judges whether they have a very clear understanding of the separation of powers. And this is an objective criteria. And this, to me, is not mentality. It's sheer legal education, <laughs> knowledge. It's a very clear understanding of the role of courts, their fundamental rights protection role, their democratic procedure protection role, um, the limits of what they can do, the options of remedies, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't even think you ever have to ask them what to do in a future case. You have to make sure they understand what courts are about and parliaments are about. And this is not to be taken for granted because not everyone graduated from the University of Toronto, where I'm sure it's taught. But. <laughs> My point is that beyond the knowledge of good law and doctrine and how to decide a case, that very foundational knowledge of the structural institutional components of a legal system are key to, to what there is. And I myself, we don't have TV type interviews with justices uh, to be appointed to the bench. I'm coming from a system where political parties are responsible for naming us to get on the bench. So we are totally politicized in that procedure, but they require a two-third majority in a multi-party system to elect us to the bench, so we are depoliticized by a broad uh, acceptance. And then when we're on the bench, we're not suicidal, so we depoliticize ourselves, <laughs> because the worst that can happen to you if your colleague already knows what you're gonna vote for, so they don't talk to you anymore. So uh, this is what we do. But when I was appointed or proposed by the Green Party, outsider jurisprudence, I can tell you a bit about that. The Conservative Party was, um, how to put that in a British way? <laughs> Skeptical. <laughs> and their interview was all about separation of powers. They were entirely fair. They didn't ask me about any you know, controversial, ideological, whatever issue. They wanted to know whether I understand and respect parliament, and I do. Um, and I think that was at least, that was what I was later told, one reason to agree with that radical feminist somebody from the Green Party to be put on that bench. So I think that's the only thing. You have a task out there to explain those foundational structures of legal systems and appointment committees and everybody else have a task in asking that very question. Not what do we do rule on abortion, but do you understand that there's a task for politicians and parliaments to regulate abortion, but there's also a task of constitutional courts and Supreme Courts to protect the minority of sorts, which is the individual who doesn't have a say in those majority decisions, which are women, pregnant women in this case, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, th th it's, to me it's, and I wonder, <laughs> not mentality, but really a competence to understand the structural foundations. So my question is, would you by now add that question when you're in charge? Well, <laughs> I am no longer in charge. Um, but what I was trying to get over, of course, I was trying to cover so much ground, um, that we can talk about the separation of powers, but we then have to ask ourselves, OK, so what does that mean in the context of a situation in which it is the job of the judiciary to protect individual human rights. Um, and that's where you have to ask yourself, individual human rights very frequently, it's true under the Canadian Charter, it's true under the European Convention, it's true under the German um, Constitution, uh, involve balancing acts between, they involve proportionality, they involve 
um, the rights of an individual against the common, what is perceived by legislators or the government as the common good. It involves all of that. And to what extent is it proper for the courts to answer some of those judgments about where the balance lies? Because it's all about, in most of these rights, it's about a fair balance. Uh, and which aspects of that is it proper for the courts to get involved in and which aspects are not. And you can understand the separation of powers without necessarily having the same approach to that question, I think. Um, that's what I was trying to explain because I think that's what's going on. And maybe therefore mentality does come into it um, because some of us thought that when a government had declared, well, we are parties to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The government had declared that although there was not a statutory duty in most of central government to have due regard to the need to safeguard and protect the welfare of children in any decision that they made, which there is in some aspects of government, that the government would actually do that in all its decision making. And then the government decides that it is going to um, cap benefits at less than the government prescribed amount that a household needs. Uh, and how could they make that decision if they were having due regard to the best interests of the children involved who were not going to have enough to eat? Um, and, and there were several, there have been three separate cases uh, involving separate things. Now, yes, of course, there's a socio-economic balancing act going on there. And if good enough reasons are given for doing it, the courts are going to say it is justified. But we have to look at those reasons, and we have to decide whether they're good enough, I think, um, bearing in mind the background of the commitment to the welfare of children that the government has declared, although it's not incorporated into UK law. Uh, that's what the debate was about in some of those cases. And that's the case that is strongest in um, not vouchsafing any sort of concern for the international obligations that the UK has, has um, introduced uh, was the one which said, you can only have benefits for two children. No matter how many children you've got, you can only have benefits for two children. And that was the strongest, strong, most strongly worded one of the judgment, the seven judgments that, that are referred to. Um, because it had previously been accepted that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was relevant to the justification of the measure. Not necessarily determinative, but relevant. I said it's not even relevant. So you see what I'm getting at? <laughs> Yes, you can have a theoretical understanding of this, but when you actually concretize it, it comes down to some really difficult judgments to be made. I so. see Justice Bear taking notes, so the conversation might continue. Um, but in the meantime, please introduce yourself, and then one more question, and then um, we'll have ample opportunity and reason to thank Lady Hale for this great discussion. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lady Hale, for being here and for speaking. I'm uh, Leah. I'm a UK LLB student on exchange here, so it's, I'm very honored to be in your present and Lord Dyson's as well. Um, and my question is more about, you mentioned some judicial pension cuts previously, mm -hmm. and I was wondering all this lack of resources to the judiciary, do you think it's affecting, is it a way that the government or the executive is trying to control perhaps the judiciary in a more like passive way and if so can something be done to stop it because it goes against the principle of the separation of powers mm, yes <laughs> well thank you uh, i don't myself think that the the changes in the pension scheme were aimed at controlling the judges i think they were just there to save money um, and the uh the treasury did not accept that the judges were a different sort of public servant from civil servants. 
they thought that the same sort of considerations that are applicable to the civil service pension scheme should be applicable to the uh, judicial pension scheme. Um, so I think that was what the thinking was. I don't think it was an attempt to control the judges. I don't know whether Lord Dyson agrees with me, but I, I suspect, I think he does, he's, he, he's nodding. Um, th that, was, that was the basic problem, because the really serious problem was that they changed the rules for people who were already in post, who had left lucrative practices to become judges uh, on the basis of a package, which was you know, a, a lower salary than they would be making in, um, in practice, but with a decent, secure pension scheme. So that, that was one of the... The other thing was the age discrimination involved in it. <laughs> because, and this happened not only for the judges, it also happened for the firefighters, and no doubt a lot of other public sector pensions, where they devised a scheme uh, which actually better protected those who most least needed the protection, who were the ones who'd been serving longest. And you could tell why this would be the sort of thing that um, unions would, would like, you know, let's, let's protect the older. But actually, the people who suffered the most were the people who'd been serving the shortest amount of time. Uh, and this is in both the judiciary and in the firefighters, age-related. And so a group of judges, along with a group of firefighters, it was two separate cases, obviously, uh, took proceedings uh, for age discrimination in the employment tribunal, and they won before the Employment Tribunal. Actually, the firefighters lost, I think, at first instance, but they, and then they went to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, and they won. Uh, and then they went to the Court of Appeal, and they won. And they, the government obviously applied to, uh, uh, for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, and we said, oh, there's no reason for us to touch this case. This is all a question of justification. Um, and uh, the three courts that know the most about it have all decided that it wasn't justified, so we're not going to interfere much to everybody's surprise. <laughs> so, so litigation did have uh, an effect on sorting it out, which is comforting, uh, at least. Um, but I don't think it was to do with trying to control the judges, which is the answer to your question. Okay. Oh, yeah, thank you, Lady Elf, for a wonderful talk. It was very, very interesting. Uh, my question is, you presented the issue of the independence of judiciary as being kind of a, a dual relationship between judiciary and executive, a confrontation, but you didn't talk much about the third branch, the legislature. And I'm wondering the kind of role that it plays, institutionally speaking, in guaranteeing mm -hmm. the independence of mm -hmm. judiciary. Because it seems that in Miller too, for example, um, judges were upholding a certain understanding of democracy, but parliamentary democracy, as mm -hmm. opposed to, let's say, plebiscitary understanding mm -hmm. of democracy, or even a presidential conception of executive power. So, but it seems that this avenue and this justification for the prorogation decision is only available if the UK Parliament is indeed unruly in some sense. And it is unruly, at least compared with the Canadian case. Backbenchers support for the government program cannot be taken for granted. And we saw, for example, this summer that even cabinet ministers resigned from the government. So my question is, does the independence of the judiciary in the UK depends on the independence of the legislature from the executive? And what does your experience tell us in other contexts where the parliament might not be so unruly? Mm. Mm. Well, that's a very interesting question, isn't it? Um, we, I don't know the answer to it, actually. Um, obviously, we are, to a considerable extent, dependent upon the legislature for preserving our independence. The legislature could change the terms of our appointments. They could change the appointment system, which they did, in fact, um, in the 2005 Act. Uh, they could do all sorts of things that are damaging to the independence of the judiciary or to the working of the justice system, the effective working of the justice system. On the whole, they haven't done that. Um, but because we have you know, the, the principal principle of the UK Constitution is the sovereignty of Parliament, they could do all of those things. But so far, they haven't. The, the, uh, what we had to do in both of the Miller cases was to uh, defend Parliament against the executive's attempts to, um, to get round it. 
Now, admittedly, as I said, Parliament in the certainly it wasn't so unruly uh, in the first Miller case, the one the one about, but it was definitely incredibly unruly, <laughs> amazingly, unprecedentedly unruly uh, in the um, in, in the run-up to to the second uh, case. Um, but of course, we would think that it's perhaps Parliament's job to be unruly, and that we have, on the whole, because our theory is that we choose a government because it can control, can command a majority in the House of Commons, uh, this, of course, gives governments enormous power. So in a way, it's rather refreshing when Parliament starts to say, hang on there, you can't do that, Mary. And uh, you know, we, want to have, we want to have our say. The most amazing thing that happened uh, in that week before Parliament was prorogued was that they decided that they would take control of their own agenda. Now, to some constitutions, the idea that the government controls the agenda of Parliament, you know, not just gets its own way when it proposes things, but actually controls what Parliament discusses, is extraordinary. Um, and indeed, I don't think I kind of fully appreciated this uh, until relatively recently. But Parliament decided that it would get control of its own agenda, which made it even more difficult to control. It's not surprising that they wanted to prorogue it and get it out of the way, but the trouble is, you know, they're not allowed to do that. Um, so part of me is quite um, encouraged by the idea that, that Parliament might um, flex its muscles and, and not always do uh, what the government wants it to do. And of course, we've had a recent example of similar unruliness. Um, uh, uh, and it, it's a bit of a check on what is otherwise um, an extraordinary degree of power which the government in power in the UK has. Not quite as much here, is it? Um, but, it but it really is quite extraordinary what the level of power is. And, and so part of me is quite, quite encouraged by it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for the question. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And so I think what's really come very out loud and clear, and it was a theme in your remarks and then also a theme in the exchange, is that what, what we've been discussing isn't just for lawyers, it's for all of us in society, be it in the UK, be it here um, in Canada, or in, at least in any Western democracy, and it, it underscores that law is fundamentally a practice, meaning that people need to uphold it, and that is lawyers, and it is law students, or anyone actually getting it across. And the question that we were discussing this a little last night, but I also kept thinking, listening to you returning to that theme, is how do we deal with the poll that you cited? How do we deal with this kind of lack of appreciation for the importance of the invisible, right? It is largely invisible to people, the legal system, unless they're obviously confronted with it in this, that, or the other context, but how do we build up the appreciation for the fundamental importance of what we're all um, uh, concerned with for society at large? So we'll no doubt continue this conversation, but I want to Thank you for a truly wonderful lecture and also for this wonderful engagement with us. This was a, a great conversation. And we were thinking um, what we might give you as a parting gift other than the refreshment intellectually and, and otherwise. And so we were toying with the idea of a brooch and then we thought, hmm, I don't know, that seems sort of hard to enter that game. You know, what could we do, a Canada goose maybe, or a raccoon, something distinctly Canadian. But first of all, we couldn't find anything that would have matched up to what you typically um, wear, but also we just it just didn't seem right. So we thought that we'd think outside the box a bit, although what I have here is in a box. And this is just a very small token of appreciation from us at the Faculty of Law and the University of Toronto. To you, thank you so much for a wonderful Goodman Lecture. Oh. You didn't have to give me anything. The pleasure of being here is quite enough. So thank you true, very much. True indeed. gifts are not given because they have to be given. No. Ah, well.
Now, this is a scarf of the University of Toronto. So isn't that lovely? And it seems to be a map of the city. Yes, that's lovely. That's Very good. really lovely. Well, actually, it's a map of the campus, isn't it? That um, is right, yes. Yes, yes. Well, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you very You're much very indeed. You're welcome, yes. but most yes. of all, thank yes. you, and yes. thanks to everyone. And I think the colour work matches very well indeed, so that's also uh, good thinking. Yeah. Yeah.